we're concluding our series, Jesus Hope for Humanity uh, today, and it's been a great series. You know, I love all the festivities of Christmas. I love the lights. I love the songs. I love the sweet treats. I love all of it, uh, but it's been really, really awesome to dig into the life of Jesus and to dig into why Jesus came and to dig into some of the prophecies that spoke about Jesus long before he came. And we've been using uh, this uh, verses from Isaiah. You can even turn to your Bibles right now to Isaiah chapter 9. And we've been using these verses in Isaiah to talk about Jesus and these four different names, these four descriptions of who Jesus would be, who the Messiah, this coming Christ would be, and what he would bring to the earth. Earth and what he would mean uh, in that time, but also mean in our lives today. And we've been uh, reading through these verses and seeing the impact that Jesus makes on our lives. And, you know, I think about Isaiah and how Isaiah, uh, he prophesied about the coming Messiah 700 years before Jesus was born. In fact, all throughout the Old Testament, you see these different prophecies. Isaiah, he is one of the four major prophets. He had lots to say about the Messiah. And so we focus in on him uh, because he had so much to say surrounding the birth of Jesus. Some even call him the Christmas prophet of the Old Testament. But the amazing part about Jesus is that out of all these prophecies, there was over 300 prophecies and Jesus fulfilled them all. And there are some studies that say that would be basically statistically impossible, but I'm so glad that we serve a God who's specializes in the impossible. And Jesus did the impossible and fulfilled all the things, all the words that were spoken about his life. And, and so we look at this key verse and, and the impact that Jesus made. Look at what it says in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. It says, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called. This has been our focus. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. If you haven't gotten a chance, I encourage you, go back and listen to the previous messages, Pastor John and Pastor Mundo last week. And it says that of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. Hold on to that right there. It says he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteous from that time on and forever. And it says the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And this weekend, we're going to focus on this last one, Prince of Peace. Everybody at all locations say Prince of Peace. Jesus, our Prince of Peace. It comes from the original Hebrew, Sar Shalom. Sar Shalom, Sar, where we get our word czar, or the Romans, they later turned it into, into Caesar, or as we say in Tennessee, Caesar, like little Caesars. Come on, hot and ready. You know you get a hot and ready sometimes. Sometimes, man, it's the struggle be real. You got to just pull over and get a hot and ready. But Sar, it means our captain. It means chief, general, governor. Keeper, ruler, the one who is in charge of our peace. And then that word shalom, shalom, it means peace. In fact, uh, the Hebrew culture, the Jewish culture, they use shalom as a greeting. It's a way of speaking a blessing over people. It means rest and tranquility, peace, completeness, wellness, soundness, prosperity, it also even refers to peace with God through covenant relationship, our Sar Shalom. That means that Jesus is the ruler or the keeper of our completeness, our soundness, our rest, our peace with God. And so when we think about peace, when we look at peace, there really can be two thoughts about peace. When we think about peace, you know, it, it, this word Shalom, it doesn't quite translate exactly how we might imagine peace. Uh, for some of you, when I say the word peace, you might imagine the beach with some waves crashing in, or you might imagine the stillness of looking over at the mountains, or maybe you imagine a quiet walk through the forest and just enjoying nature, or, or maybe like me, you might imagine your, your kids sleeping through the night and not waking up in Jesus' name. Come on, pray for your boy, man. Pray for you. This, man, y'all don't, oh, I'm about to knock something over. Y'all don't know. I, I got, and so you might think of these things, but, but there's two ways to look at peace. 
First, you might think of peace as that means nothing's happening. It means that I can kick up. I can put my feet up and I can lay back and I can relax because there's, there's nothing going on. I have complete tranquility because there's no issues, there's no dramas, there's no situations. It's kind of like the peace that we have between the U.S. and Canada. There's no issue, no tension, no threat of war or anything like that. But when it comes to this peace, this peace is, is a little more kind of like the peace that as the Roman government, they spread and they just like dominated everybody and they had peace because they had complete control and they had conquered everybody. And that gives us a more true picture of Jesus, our Prince of Peace. He's conquered everything. He's conquered all. He conquered death. He conquered hell. He conquered the grave. And because he conquered, because he dominated, we have peace. He won our peace. He won our peace, not because there wasn't problems, not because there wasn't chaos, but because he had the power to overcome. And in that same way, he wins peace for you and I even today. He won our peace for us. And so Jesus, as the Prince of Peace, is not just a sleep in heavenly kind of peace. It's a conquering, like overcoming kind of peace. Jesus is our conquering ruler of peace. He's the conquering ruler of peace. You know, I'm preaching about peace, but I feel like fighting a little bit. Come on, somebody. He overcame. And so because of Jesus, we win peace. We win because of him. You know, I think about it in the gospel. You see this shift in the gospel of John around chapter 12, where, where Jesus starts to talk about. He talks about how he's going to be betrayed, and he talks about how uh, he's going to die, and he starts talking about these things, and he tells his disciples, you know, they start getting, uh, you know, uneasy, and, and he tells them in John chapter 16, verse 33, he said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, look, look, he follows it up. You just said you want us to have peace, but then he says, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. Everybody say, take heart. He says, take heart, for I have overcome the world. Come on, Jesus said, I've already conquered the thing that you think is going to conquer you. I've already overcome the thing that you think is overcoming you. You don't have to be overwhelmed. You don't have to be, you don't have to worry. You don't have to fret. You don't have to live in anxiety because I've already won peace for you. I've already won it for you. You think about the story of Jesus and the birth of Jesus. It's not just a little cute story about a little cute family so we can have a little cute nativity scene in our yard. And I, I love all that. Don't get me wrong. But you have to understand that the birth of Jesus changed everything. The birth of Jesus changed everything. Jesus was not a coincidence. He's not just a good man. He's not just a cute little baby sleeping in a manger. Jesus is not a myth. He's not just a philosophy. He was the plan in the beginning. He's not plan B. He was the plan all along. The Bible says that he was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. He's the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. He was there before the beginning. He's going to be there after the end. I don't know about you, but I'm really excited about a Jesus that's more than just a baby. Come on. He's our conquering prince of peace. He has overcome, so we overcome. We overcome in him. This Jesus who won our peace, he is our Sar Shalom, our Sar Shalom. And so when I think about what Jesus won and what that makes available to us, there's a few things that I want to share with you this morning. And the first thought is this, because of Jesus, we have won peace with God. Everybody say, we won. We won. We shot the BB gun. No, I'm just... <laughs> We won. Because of Jesus, we have won peace with God. When I think about how we win or we won, I think about how many of us have our favorite teams that we love. And I, I grew up in New Orleans, so, man, I'm black and gold to the Super Bowl. Who that? The Saints all day. I'm a New Orleans Saints fan. Drew Brees, come and get them. Come on. And we win a lot, especially this season. We're going to talk about this season. We win a lot. And when I think about how we cheer for our favorite teams and, and how you have this group of guys or this group of girls that, that go out and, 
and they all their life they're showing up to practices and they're learning technique and they're learning strategy and they're studying about the game and they're they're looking at film and if they got get injured they have to work through the pain of coming back from an injury and then they show up on game day and they put their all into the game and they're sweating and they're hustling and they're diving and they're jumping and they're taking hits and and taking elbows to the face and all these different things and and then I think about our contribution to the whole process we get to sit on the couch and eat wings and pizza and we get to criticize them when they don't do what we thought they should do and we get to tell them good job when they do something we thought they should have did in the first place and I think about all that but in the end if they win a championship, we get to jump up and say, we won. Well, guess what? It's the same way with Jesus. We were powerless. We didn't do nothing. He did all the hard work. He went to the cross. He took the nails. He took the beatings. It's by his stripes we are healed. He was wounded for our transgressions. He didn't do anything to deserve what he got. But guess what? When he rose from the grave, we had the power to say we won. Come on, I need somebody up in here, somebody maybe at Germantown Parkway who is excited that we won because of Jesus. We have peace with God because of him. Jesus paid the price to eternally secure your peace with God. The work that Jesus did on the cross eternally secured your right standing with God. When when he looks at you, he sees the blood of his son covering all your sins, washing them away, making you white as snow. Come on, he says he forgets our sins to remember them no more. Jesus He won our peace with God. We don't get the credit for it. Look at what it says in Romans chapter 5. It says this. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith. Everybody say through faith. We have, what's that word? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at what it says in verse 6 of that same chapter. It says, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless. Yo, we couldn't do nothing. Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die, but God. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Right through him, for while we were God's enemies, we were lined up on the wrong side, y'all. We were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Come on. It's through Jesus we have peace with God. You are eternally secure because of the price. In Christ, you are eternally secure. Because of the price that Jesus paid, the sacrifice that he made. You know, every sacrifice in the Bible, when you look at the Old Testament and you hear about all the bulls and the goats and all that was just a foreshadowing of the ultimate price that Jesus would would pay so that we could have peace with God. So because of Jesus, we have one peace with God. But then the next thought I would say this is through Jesus, we can win peace within. Through Jesus, we can win peace within. Through, I'll say it again, through Jesus, we can win peace within. For many believers, you would say, man, I've accepted Christ and and I've received peace with God, but for some reason, I got all this stuff going on in my life and I'm not really walking in and experiencing this peace of God, the peace of God. And that's what God wants you to experience. He wants you to not only have peace with him, but he wants you to experience, to have his peace on the inside of you, to live in peace on the inside of you so that you're not tossed to and fro by every situation, every wind, everything that comes and goes. Even in the face of chaos, even in the face of tragedy, we can still live and we can still walk in God's peace. And so if we don't walk in his peace, then that means there must be some things that are disturbing our peace. Maybe some things that are clogging up the flow of our peace. Last week, it had to be during the sound of Christmas, too. During the sound of Christmas, we had some plumbing issues, y'all. And I'm not a plumber. (laughs) And so 
what was going on, our house is real interesting. We have a, we have a bathroom. It's like a half bath in our laundry room. It, it comes in handy. It's like right off the kitchen. It's still kind of odd to us, but it comes in handy. It's, and, and so what happened is that toilet got clogged up, but it's a toilet that we almost never use because our dog sleeps in there. And, and so it was, there was no reason that it should be clogged up. And we're trying to figure it out. I'm over like plunging it and like what in the world is going on? And, and then I start to see stuff coming out. Now, not that, not that kind of stuff. Now, don't get nervous. But I started to see like corn and tomatoes and beans coming out. I'm like, what in the world is happening? I, I asked Ashley, I'm like, did somebody try to flush a burrito down the toilet? Like, what in, what's going on? And, and so I couldn't get it. And, and so I told Ashley, well, I'm going to just call him and, and get something set up. And so I leave it alone and, and I go to the kitchen and I was washing some dishes and, and, and then I hit the garbage disposal to let the, get the water out of the sink, and I hear water splashing in the laundry room. All the water from the sink was coming up and out of the toilet, all over the floor in the laundry room. And so thankfully, we had this wet vac, and so I'm in there sucking up all this water and moving the dryer around and moving the washer around to clean the floor and like putting bleach on the floor and just all going through all this work. And, and then I wasn't thinking. I took the dog's bed because the dog had been sleeping in there. I took the bed and just threw it in the washer and I started the washer, but then the washer started to drain. And guess what? All the water from the washer came up and out of the toilet all over again. But when the specialist came, he immediately knew what was going on. And what I thought was just a toilet, there was actually something going on beneath the surface that I didn't see. There was actually something going on in the pipes below the house. He had to go under the surface. And guess what? Sometimes you have to see beyond the struggle. That's the first tip I would give you. If you're going to have peace within, if you're going to have peace within, you have to see beyond the struggle. If you're going to experience God's peace within, you got to see that there's something beyond what you're facing. There's something beyond what you're walking through. There's something spiritual happening. There's, there's an enemy of our soul that wants, to, that wants to rob us of our peace. He wants to take your peace away. And so I've got these three tips. That first one is see beyond the struggle. Look at what it says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 12. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord. And in his mighty power, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Come on, don't be deceived into thinking that it's only natural. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You see, we have our prince of peace, but there's also what the Bible calls the prince of the power of the air, the ruler of darkness, the ruler of the unseen dark powers that works against us. He's organized. He's got rulers and authorities and powers. He's got ranks, and he's working against you. And so you've got to see beyond the struggle. You've got to see that there's something spiritual happening. And I think about, think ahead to these 21 days of prayer and fasting, it's a great opportunity for us to turn up the heat spiritually so that we just don't try to approach our life and approach our difficulties and approach every situation with natural means, but that we can inject some spiritual power into the situations that we are going through. And that's when you're going to experience real peace. You'll experience real peace. One of the best things we can do When our peace feels disturbed, it's go to the word of God because the word is living, it's active. And I love how Isaiah, he's he's got some verses that he talks about peace. Isaiah 26, three says, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Isaiah 26, 12, it says, the Lord will establish, excuse me, it says, Lord, you establish peace for us. All that we have accomplished, you have done for us. Isaiah 55, 12, you will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. Man, that's something to declare in the morning before you leave the house. I'm going out in joy. I'm going to be led forth in peace. We get into God's word so that we can see beyond our struggle. The second tip I would give you is this. The second tip I would give you is stay above the drama. Stay above the drama. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to get you ready for Christmas. Stay above the drama. The drama. Look at what it says in Colossians 3, 
verse 12 through 17, it says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Come on, those are all peaceful words. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Look at that. Thankfulness is connected to peace. It says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We have to stay above the drama. If somebody's hurt you, forgive them. If somebody's done something to you, be quick to forgive. We don't hold on to these things. We don't see people through the eyes of hurt or the eyes of anger, but we see them the same way the Lord has forgiven us. You know, it's amazing how even during holiday time, how people get upset and they cause arguments just because they didn't get what they wanted for Christmas. Come on, somebody. Trying to help you. Christmas morning. Receive it with a smile. Even if it's another ugly sweater. Anyway. (laughs) Come on, all these quarrels and all these fights that are on the inside of us. Come on, they manifest on the outside. If we're not careful, we got to walk in peace. The third tip I would give you when it comes to winning peace within, the third thing I would say is keep the main thing the main thing. That verse, verses we just read, that last thing, it says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, keep it all about Jesus. Whatever you do, keep it all about Jesus. See, peace isn't meant to come and go. The peace of God doesn't flee in the face of chaos. But in fact, that's where it shines the brightest. I, I love this, this picture of peace. that I, There was a story I read once, and it says, there was once a king who offered a prize to the artist who would paint the best picture of peace. Many artists tried, and the king looked at all the pictures, but there were only two he really liked, and he had to choose between them. One picture was of a calm lake. The lake was a perfect mirror for peaceful, towering mountains were all around. Overhead was a blue sky with fluffy white clouds, and all who saw this picture thought that it was the perfect picture of peace. The other picture, it had mountains too, but these were rugged and bare. Above was an angry sky from which rain fell and which lightning played. Down the side of the mountain tumbled a foaming waterfall. This did not look peaceful at all, but when the king looked, he saw behind the waterfall a tiny bush growing in a crack in the rock. And the bush, in the bush, a mother bird had built her nest. There in the midst of the rush of angry water sat the mother bird on her nest. This was perfect peace. And the king explained, peace does not mean to be in a place where there is no noise, trouble, or hard work. Peace means to be in the midst of all those things and still be calm in your heart. The real meaning of peace. The presence of chaos in your life, the presence of pain in your life, the presence of tragedy in your life does not mean the absence of peace. Even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because he is with me and he can comfort me. He can bring me peace. He can bring me peace. John chapter 14, 27, Jesus said this. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I just want to encourage you. Maybe you're struggling with peace on the inside. Jesus says, I give you my peace. You know, so often people say, I'm just trying to find my peace. Well, stop trying to find your peace and grab onto his peace. He's got peace that's available to you today. The third thought I would give you is this. With Jesus, we can win peace in the world. Everybody at every campus say, it doesn't stop with me. You see, we can have peace with God, and we can experience peace within, 
But now Jesus, our Prince of Peace, he's counting on us to be his ambassadors of peace to the world around us. He's counting us to take this peace that we've experienced with him, to take this peace that we walk in, and to take that peace and inject heavenly peace into earthly chaos. He's counting on us. Look at what it says. We, we read that verse earlier in Isaiah chapter 9, that of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. It's not going to end. Well, how is it not going to end? Because it doesn't stop with me. It spreads with me. That means that if I walk in peace with God and I'll have the peace of God on the inside of me, every situation that I walk into, I bring that peace with me. Everywhere I go, I spread that peace with me. Every person that I impact, they experience his peace and that peace spreads. In fact, that's the only reason we have peace with God in the first place. Because years ago, there were people that experienced the peace of God and they passed it on from generation to generation to generation and his kingdom will never end because it keeps going from generation to generation to generation. More and more people experience peace with God and they walk in the peace of God. It never ends. The greatness of his rulership, the ruler of peace and his peace, his government, his rulership will never end because we're called to spread it. Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians 5. Starting at verse 16, it says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. We don't look at people just from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. I used to not walk in peace. I used to not live in peace. I used to not have peace with God. But now, that's all gone, and now the new me, the new life, the new point of view, the new perspective. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Look at this, verse 18. All this is from God. It all comes from God. He's the source of all good things, every good and perfect gift, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us. Look at this. He reconciled us, and then he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Jesus says, I grab you, and now I'm giving you the ministry. I'm giving you the responsibility. So often we look at the world around us, and we say, where is God in all this chaos, all that's going on with our government, all that's going on with terrorism, all that's going on with racism and hatred? And we're like, where is God? Where is his peace? How is Jesus the Prince of Peace? He says, I've given you the responsibility. You are the carrier of peace. I've given you the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against him. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. He was doing it himself, as though he, he does it himself through us. He does it through us. And it says, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God has called us to be peacemakers. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, in the Beatitudes, he said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are these ambassadors of peace, these people that carry peace. We go out and we make, we don't make war, we make peace. Well, in some ways, we fight. We make war with the enemy to fight for peace for people. And we rescue people to experience the peace of God. He's given us this message of reconciliation because it does not stop with us. I want to leave you with this last thought, this last verse, because I feel like it really gives us this picture of how this thing works. James chapter 3, verse 18. It says, peacemakers. Everybody say peacemakers. peacemakers. Come on, that's you and me. Who sow, we sow seed into people's lives. We sow seed into our city. We sow seed into our nation. We sow in peace, reap a harvest of righteousness. That's not only in our own lives, but that's as other people experience the righteousness that's true righteousness that's only found in Christ. Come on. Because of Jesus, we have won peace with God. Through Jesus, we can have peace within. And with Jesus, we can win peace in the world. Come on, do you receive God's word this weekend? Come on, let's really thank God.
for his word and 